All right, we'll get going. I didn't realize how late you all were. <laughs> Revelation 12. <clears throat> Revelation 12, following upon the blowing of the seventh and last trumpet in Revelation 11, declaring the kingdom of God, kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of the Lord. And then in chapter 12, we've been looking at a gospel drama, as it were, being played out in a vision before John. Revelation 12, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of 12 stars, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered, and there appeared another woman and another wonder in heaven, and behold a great red dragon having seven heads and 10 horns and seven crowns upon his heads, and his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and threescore days. And there was war in heaven and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and he prevailed not, <clears throat> and neither was their place found any more in heaven. Father, we thank you for <clears throat> your word, we pray, as we enter into it again this, this Lord's Day. We're thankful for giving us the Lord's Day and, and for the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and for the time in which we can set ourselves apart from the world uh, to set ourselves unto your word and your Christ and for his great atonement made. We pray that you would bless our souls this day with nourishment from your word, that we would uh, be made to again increase in our love and trust in you and our rejoicing and our praise of you and our thankfulness for you. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. <clears throat> so the great drama is being played out here in, in verse 1. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun. That's the woman is the church. <clears throat> and we do understand this to be a vision. We do understand this to be something that's symbolic. So as we're looking at it, when we're thinking about something symbolic, the, the symbolic and the real flow together because the symbols represent something. But then sometimes it's confusing to us because when the symbols and the real begin to mix together, we begin to think, well, how can that be? How can that be real? And we forget that part of this is just symbolic that we have to understand there's likeness here and not, not a perfect uh, display of what actually uh, what actually is taking place in a physical form or a literal form. So the woman is the church. She's clothed in the glory of God, clothed with the sun. Under her feet, the moon, all inferior lights are beneath her feet as she exercises dominion in the earth. She, has only, she only has the true light of God. Her crown <clears throat> upon her head her crown, the doctrine and practice of the 12 apostles, the blessing of that given to the church. She being with child, verse two, travailing in birth, pain to be delivered. She has been expecting for centuries, the church was to give birth to the deliverer. And she is now very much pregnant with that because she's about to deliver because Christ is about to come. And there appears another wonder in heaven, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, <clears throat> which elsewhere talked about as authorities and powers, seven kings, ten kings, and seven crowns upon his heads. Satan also is a wonder, and we know that he exercises his power on the earth. He has usurped the authority of God. He is alive and well in the hearts and minds of men and authorities and powers, 
and he works through these instruments to <clears throat> seek to uh, disparage or crush the kingdom of God. Verse 4, his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. We spent time on that last week. Satan's apostasy drew other angelic beings into rebellion with Satan, and he's poised to devour Messiah, of which, of course, we looked at last week he could not do. And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. I take that to be the Lord Jesus Christ. And her child was caught up to God and to his throne. <clears throat> I take that to be the ascension, <clears throat> being seated at the right hand of the Father on high. These are the great elements of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ was born, Satan was foiled, the atonement was made, which established the authority upon which the new race of men would be created for the new heavens and the new earth. <clears throat> so turn to Hebrews chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 2. And we'll see somewhat of an explanation of this uh, gospel drama. It says, in Hebrews 2, 5, For unto the angels he has not put in subjection the world to come. Angels are not going to be the ones ruling and reigning in the new world. Whereof we speak, but one in a certain place testified, Psalm 8, What is man that you are mindful of him? the son of man that you visit him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of your hands. So man was given stewardship of the earth and man again will rule. Man is destined to rule the new heavens and new earth. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet for in that he put all things in subjection under him, that is, he has ordained the subjection of all things to be under the feet of man. He did this originally in the command to take possession and dominion over the earth. Satan entered in the great drama that has been played out upon the earth, but man will subdue the earth. For in that he... Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. And the only exception to that is given to us in 1 Corinthians 15 when it says that Christ hands over the kingdom, all things are subjection to him. And it says, of course, not. We're not talking about God the Father. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are over all. But now, the writer says, we, we see not yet all things under him. We don't see. We don't presently see, the writer says. We don't see man subduing the earth for the glory of God. We see it in pieces, but we don't see it the way God ordained it. But, it says, but we see Jesus. There's our hope. <laughs> the new man, the second Adam, the one who is ordained to judge the nations and to lead in the new heaven and the new earth. But we see Jesus also made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. See very similar there the, what it was said in Psalm 8, that he by the grace of God should taste death for every man. So in the gospel drama that's played out, man will have rule over the earth. And that rule is epitomized in the Lord Jesus Christ, the second Adam, the new man. He is the head of that race by which the earth is subdued. And he is the one who subdues all things unto himself. And then with the new race of men, we find later on in the book of Revelation, it's Christ on his white horse with all the saints with him following but none of this comes easy. <clears throat> there is suffering to be endured before the accomplishment of 
the new heavens and the new earth, and the subjection of all things to men. Turn to Colossians chapter 1. Because in our text, it's going to talk about the woman fleeing into the wilderness, a place prepared of God. Within this whole chapter of chapter 12, it speaks of the persecution of the woman or of the church, of the new man. Colossians chapter 1, 21 says, And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. <clears throat> we were part of the problem and we become in Christ by regeneration, by grace, we become a new man. Yet now has he reconciled in the body of his flesh through the new man, through Christ, the second Adam, in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight through the Lord Jesus Christ and his atoning work. He creates the new race of men, which are unreprovable in the sight of God because of the perfect atonement and propitiation of Christ. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, because this is only for those who believe upon Jesus Christ. This is only for those who do not put their hope elsewhere, who do not abandon the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ because his hope is the only hope and all other hopes are false hopes. And be not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven whereof I, Paul, was made a minister who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind in the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, which is, is saying what I just said before, none of this comes easy. So <clears throat> the revelation of Jesus Christ, this book is giving an encouragement to a suffering church and the church has always been a suffering church, living in the midst of a persecuting world so that the accomplishment of all things and the bringing us to the new heavens and the new earth does not come easy and has never come easy. And as Paul says, there are yet afflictions in the body that have to be accomplished. There's still suffering that has to be made. Not talking about for an atonement because the atonement of Jesus Christ is perfect. This is not an atonement he's talking about in these sufferings. What he's talking about is that the accomplishment, the means used to bring men to the Lord Jesus Christ, to bring the gospel to the world, and to tell everybody about Jesus Christ and to bring all the elect in is going to be costly, which is why he tells people to count the cost before they confess Christ. So <clears throat> back in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 6, and the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God. So she is fleeing because she is being persecuted. <clears throat> because as we read further on in this whole chapter, the devil is cast out of heaven and he's got a little bit of time and he's going to persecute the church. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God. So she is fleeing <clears throat> under persecution and yet still cared for by God. She still has a place. She hasn't lost her place with God just because... The church is hotly persecuted and terribly persecuted. She doesn't lose her place with God. God, she has a place with God. And there is, she, she's under the covert of the wings of the Almighty yet. That they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And as I said before, that number, some people tie to years and tie it to a particular period of time in the past. Others would tie it to, uh, would call it days and tie it to a particular time in the past, or others say it's the future and want to tie it to a particular time of tribulation in the Christian church. And I'm here to tell you that I've not been convinced yet what it is, so 
I, I can't tell you what it is because I'm not, I'm not convinced in my own soul about a position. But this I am convinced of. The church is going to have more times of fleeing and she's still going to be cared for by God. That I'm convinced of. David fled to the hills when he was persecuted by Saul. <clears throat> and God cared for David. The historian of the Hebrews said, they were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in the dens and caves of the earth. Joseph and Mary had to flee. The angel of the Lord came to them in a dream and said, you need to flee. And they fled to Egypt. Some would tie it to that. Christ warned and instructed his men that you're going to be hated of all men for my name's sake, but he that endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee into another. For verily I say to you, you will not have gone over the cities of Israel to the Son of Man become. The apostles had to flee at times. The first century church was warned, <clears throat> Matthew 24, 15, when you Therefore, see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Stand in the holy place. Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Some tie it to this. Clark writes, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. The council was remembered and wisely followed by the Christians afterwards. Eusebius and Epi Epiphanius say... At this juncture, after Cestus Gallus had raised the siege and Vespasian was approaching with his army, all who believed in Christ left Jerusalem and fled to Pella and other places beyond the river Jordan. And so they all marvelously escaped the general shipwreck of their country and not one of them perished. That's a historic fact and some would tie this symbol to that. Paul writes of the persecution of the saints. He says, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Isaiah also cries concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we'd have been like Sodom and Gomorrah, which tells us the church will be persecuted and that there will be a remnant that will be saved out of it. But there will be a remnant and they will not be able to uh, extinguish the flame of Christ in the earth. The apostle Paul himself had to flee when he was converted Acts 9.22, Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is the very Christ. And after that, many days were filled. The Jews took counsel to kill him, but their laying wait was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. And the disciples took him by night and led him down the wall in a basket, and he fled. So, Yes, in this drama that is set before us in this symbolic language, we have the church fleeing into the wilderness, but there's a place prepared for her. She is still cared for by God. People tie it to various things, but this general truth should be firmly understood that the church will yet have times of fleeing and God will yet protect and keep his church and his truth alive in the earth. Revelation 12 in verse 13 and 14. Let's look at what the drama says concerning the dragon now, which is Satan. Verse 13, and when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. So when Satan saw he was cast unto the earth, and so we have to come up with some kind of understanding of what that means for Satan to be cast unto the earth. He persecuted the woman, which is the church, which brought forth the man-child, which is Christ. And to the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness into her place where she is nourished 
for a time and times and a half a time from the face of the serpent. So we have a repetition of this idea of her having to flee, but then also being cared for by God. So this idea in this drama is played for us more than once. Because Satan stirs up men to persecute the church, the saints, the saints flee for safety, and God preserves a remnant for himself. That this is still being played out is, is uh, I think, apparent in the world. I was looking for some uh, news that was fairly recent, of all places, Newsweek. So they must have somebody conservative in Newsweek up there. Uh, a gal named Leela Gilbert, she's a fellow of Hudson Institute. She writes, and this was on January of this year. As cheerful greetings of Happy New Year fade across the world, life gradually settles back into the new normal. And alongside various concerns about yet another pandemic season, new issues emerge for those of us who follow international religious freedom, the plight of Christian believers, the most widely targeted faith group in the world, come back into focus. Countries such as North Korea, Afghanistan, and Pakistan have long been archetypes of deadly abuse against their beleaguered Christian minorities. But in recent months, dangers to Africa's Christian believers, and particularly converts from Islam, are swelling exponentially. Examples abound. In recent days, a Muslim father in central Uganda hanged his wife and two children because the young mother and oldest child converted to Christianity following a Christmas service. Uganda, a country that is 82% Christian, is increasingly the site of brutal atrocities against Christian pastors, families, and churches. Meanwhile, in neighboring Kenya, six Christian villagers Villagers were killed in early 2022 by sus suspected al-Shabaab militants. Another Christian man was murdered nearby less than a day later. In the first attack, at least one victim was shot, another hacked to death with a machete, others burned alive while they slept. In Burkina Faso, aid to the church in need recounted in the last weeks of October, a total of 147 persons, this must be in 2021, a total of 147 persons, among them eight pregnant women and 19 children under five, had to flee from two villages on the Niger border. The displaced people explained that many of them had been identified as Christians and that terrorists were expressly seeking them out to kill them because of their faith. The Counter -extre Extremism Project recently highlighted political turmoil in Somalia, that has widened the door for al-Shabaab while weakening the fight against terrorism. According to a State Department report, al-Shabaab continued to impose its own interpretation of Islamic practices and Sharia on other Muslims and non-Muslims, including executions as a penalty for alleged apostasy in areas under its control. African Christians are most certainly at risk. January 6, the Christian Post reported that more than 400 million Christians around the world live in countries that persecute churches, and that persecution is only worsening across Africa, the report says, from sub-Sahara Africa to East Africa. There are at least a couple dozen terrorist organizations that have the ambition, from their point of view, to install caliphates in their territories, which is an area in which they claim for themselves. Even North Africa isn't without its own unholy reputation for anti-Christian abuse. Algeria was noted in, as Open Door's 24th worst persecutor in 2021, alongside Tunisia, 26, and Morocco, our brother is there, 27th. Christian converts are the primary targets of persecution, not only due to family and extended family accusations and threats, but also because of abuses imposed by local leaders and elders. The convert's new faith is opposed, sometimes violently, by family and community. Nigeria has had a long, dubious distinction of being Africa's most brutal persecutor. Just days before the past Christmas, Anglican canon Hassan John, who serves in Jos, Nigeria, explained in an interview, 
For Christians in northern Nigeria, especially this year, Christmas was full of anxiety and fear from continued attacks by Islamic Fulani militias and Boko Haram terrorist Islamic sect. Many couldn't reunite with loved ones because the roads were dangerously spotted with terrorists. Violence is radical Islamic ideology, which infects individual Muslims, local mosques and villages, and coalesces into terrorist organizations. And menacingly, small organizations eventually find their ways into global Islamic networks. An alarming December 2021 report from Memory, M-E-M-R-I, revealed that across the African continent, offshoots of ISIS continue to expand, and notorious terrorist groups such as Al-Shabaab, Boko Haram, and Uganda's uh, allied democratic forces are cooperating with the Islamic State by specifically targeting African Christians as their primary targets. In West Africa, the Islamic State West African Providence has been increasingly active in the Nigerian violence against Christians and has recently embraced factions of Boko Haram, long notorious for mass kidnappings and massacres. Meanwhile, in East Africa, Memories Report introduced, with no formal announcement, the Islamic State quietly launched attacks, including suicide operations, in another Christian-majority African country, Uganda, during October and November. These attacks were claimed by ISIS' new affiliate, known as the Islamic State Central Africa Province, which has so far carried out operations in three other countries. The Democratic Republic of Congo, Mozambique, and Tanzania. It is likely and worrisome that the Biden administration will turn a blind eye to the burgeoning network of Islamic radicals who are killing African Christians half a world away. And although American churches may pray for African believers, the objects of their intercession may at times be seen as God's children, but not like us. It is timely then to reflect on the illuminating comment recently placed alongside a photo of slain African Christians. A quote from ISIS, our war is against Christians. It's a, against Christians is a war without borders and without stagnation. It is a single war on multiple fronts. The Christians of America are no different from the Christians of Uganda. So that is currently the persecution, some of the persecution that's going on, emphasis on some of the places in Africa and uh, the Islamic uh, militia as well. So that the church, <clears throat> The church is always in a state of fleeing. The church is always in a state of fleeing <coughs> because the church is always being attacked by Satan. Satan uses different organizations. He uses different ideologies. But the one thing that all ideologies outside of Christianity have in common is their hatred of Christianity, which for me is a great comfort because it shows the truth of Christianity. There is one one truth in one way, one savior, which all others cannot abide. So when we read in Revelation chapter 12, there was war in heaven, verse seven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. So what is he talking about there? Because it says in verse 9 that the great dragon was cast out. The old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast into the earth and his angels cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. Because the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God night and day. But they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives until death. So to me, the most logical chronology of this is dealing with the time of the atonement of Jesus Christ, his ascension, because it's talking about these uh, martyrs also. But this is the great difficulty of the passage is locating where and when this is talking about this war in heaven and the devil and his angels being cast out. We know that there was 
a rebellion. We know that Christ said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Okay. So there was a fall like lightning from heaven, Christ says, prior to his atonement. So some may take these symbols to mean the original fall of Satan. Uh, others would take these symbols to be chronological in the passage and therefore happen after the atonement of Jesus Christ in some fashion. Some others would take it even further up the road to the very end of the world just before the coming of Christ uh, as well. This war is mentioned in the text at least, and we know that sometimes in these dramas and sometimes in prophetic scripture, there can be not necessarily a chronological order. So we have to be careful with that. But at least in this text, if it is in chronological order, uh, we've had previous to this, the mention of the ascension of Jesus Christ. If the vision is not in chronological order, it could have been prior to the atonement. If it is, it could be following the atonement and ascension of Christ. How do angelic beings fight? We don't know. We're not told. I don't know. I can't think of a passage in which we're given that knowledge. They're pictured as warriors. They're pictured as battle people. In Elijah's time, we had the chariots of fire on the mountainsides surrounding and protecting Elijah. Uh, we have the pictures of angels at times with swords or swords drawn. So we have pictures of them as those who are doing battle. And we have lots of passages in scripture that speak of principalities and powers. And, and right here, especially, we have this thought or idea about both good and evil at odds with each other. Turn to Colossians chapter two. I'll give you at least one thought here before we finish up. I maybe should wait till next week, but I could at least give you the Reader's Digest. Colossians 2.13, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has quickened together with him, forgiven you all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailed it to the cross, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So that phrase there tells us something happened at the atonement of Jesus Christ, something special happened at the atonement of Jesus Christ in which principalities and powers, obviously evil ones, were spoiled, something was taken from them, and he made a show of them openly and triumphed over them by the atonement. Doddridge writes, by that important transaction, he has also made us victorious over all our spiritual enemies, especially the formidable spirit of darkness, having spoiled these principalities and powers of the trophies which they had gained by drawing us into the grand original apostasy and subjecting to themselves this part of God's rational creation, talking about mankind, bringing mankind underneath the powers of darkness. He has spoiled them in that by the atonement, all of the elect are paid for and they shall be one. And justly so. He has made them an open spectacle to the whole world, triumphing over them by it, even by that cross whereby they had hoped to triumph over him. But God turned their counsels against themselves and ruined their empire by that death of his son, which they have been so eager to accomplish. And then in Ephesians chapter 4, another text. Verse 8, wherefore he saith, Paul is arguing and he's making his argument based upon now this text that comes out of Psalm 68, 
Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now that he ascended, what is it? But he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. I believe that is talking about the incarnation of Christ coming as a man into the womb of Mary. He that descended into the womb of Mary is the same that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things and give gifts to men. So the idea being that the victory of Christ gave gifts to the church and a great victory to the church, okay? But he quotes it out of Psalm 68 as a proof. And Psalm 68, as Barnes says, much perplexity has been felt in regard to the principle on which Paul quotes the Psalm and then applies it to the ascension of the Redeemer. The Psalm seems to be composed on the occasion of removing the ark. And, and that is what you look at the commentators and Spurgeon included, they say Psalm 68 is a song which they sang. You remember when David took the ark out of obscurity and he brought it into a regular place, okay? Where a worship could be had there where it belonged. So that, that takes place in 2 Samuel 6 and 7, which we have studied together. In 2 Samuel 6, it's that whole story, the second time, of removing the ark properly and then bringing it with rejoicing to its place of rest, okay? And then in chapter 7, following, we read, and David had rest from all his enemies. And that's when he started thinking about building the, about building the temple. See, it's a beautiful picture there because in the ascension of Jesus Christ, we have Christ who is the Ark of the Covenant. He is the promise. He is the shed blood. He is all of that. And he ascends out of the earth to his resting place, seated at the right hand of God. Why? Because he has defeated all his enemies. Until in time... All his enemies, through the instrumentality that God uses, which is suffering often, everything will be subdued to his feet. So, I was, I was discussing this with Brother Gables on the way. Uh, I said, Brother Gables, let me give you an easy question out of Revelation 12, because I like to pick his brain. But, he, but we talked about it, and, and, and I felt as though he had some good insights. And his view of this war in heaven, where Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought the angels and prevailed not, and their place was found no more in heaven. What kind of place did they have in heaven? Well, we read in Job that he was allowed to come among the sons of God, allowed to accuse Job, right? And basically he accused Job of serving God because he gets stuff from God. But Job was not in heaven, Job was on earth. So what Jim said is that what takes place here around the portrait of the atonement is that Satan has had a plausible argument all these years and centuries that these people who are in heaven who have died and gone to heaven, that there is no atonement yet made for them. So that he could accuse them and say, you're up here. He could accuse God of having them there. He could accuse them of being there. You're up here and no atonement has been made for you. And of course, none of that matters to God. I understand that because God is the eternal present now. But what Jim was saying is that at the atonement, that plausible argument was destroyed so that Satan, the accuser of the brethren, is cast out of that capacity. He could no longer make that statement. And so that he was cast out and he knew his time was short because the atonement had been made. This was the foundation for all of the work and that the work would be accomplished and that he was cast out in that sense. Now, still lots of questions I have. You may have some, and I may have some more for you about that, but I think that's at least a plausible 
thought process for this war that was and the idea of Satan being cast out. What was he cast out of? We know he's the deceiver of the world. He's still the deceiver of the world. He could still, he could still and he no doubt does, accuse the brethren who are on earth of serving God just for the stuff they get. And maybe that's part of the reason why God has chosen through suffering for the church to come to eternal glory. Because what argument does Satan have? Oh, they serve you because they're being persecuted and killed all over the world. And it's the glory of God that his atonement is such, his person is such, his regenerating power is such, and this new life is such that these people will cling to tenaciously the lordship of Jesus Christ, though they are tortured. That's glorious. That brings a lot of revenue of glory to God. So there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon with the angels and they prevailed not and their place was not found in heaven. So I don't, we don't look at that from a standpoint almost secluded from God like the angels are having a battle over here and God's watching it and, you know, no. The same with us in spiritual battles. Our whole hope and our whole victory is the Lord Jesus Christ. So that would be the same with the holy angels as well. Because Jude says that, that when they, when they argued over the body of Moses, the soma, the body of Moses, the angels did not bring a railing accusation, but said, the Lord rebuke you. So in this battle, whatever this battle and whatever it represents, they would do the same thing. The Lord Jesus Christ rebukes you. His atonement is made. You have no argument against the saints up here. So anyways, that's a, that's a possibility. Father, we thank you for your word. Ask that you would continue to bless our hearts as we study the book that you promise a blessing with. We thank you for the victory there is in Christ our Lord. Amen.